This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. The, um, they're both prolific and well-known novelists. DJ Taylor uh, has written, uh, I think this is your 11th novel? 11th novel. Uh, it's been very, the Winds of Faction has been extremely well received, some excellent reviews. Um, historical novel, and he's done a lot in fact to reinvent forms, contemporary forms of the historical novel. Uh, he's also a biographer, of course, biographer of Orwell, and uh, for that, Thackeray. Um, in fact, I'm particularly fond of the Thackeray book. I turn to that often. Um, Helen Smith has also written uh, several novels. I think this is your sixth, is it? Six, 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 six yeah. novels. And she's also written children, yeah. Yeah. books with, uh, aimed at more aimed at children. Um, and her new novel is The Miracle Inspector, which is set future rather than the past. So we've got two kinds of uh, countervailing historical narratives, if you like, facing each other. Um, they are both going to read from their new books. Uh, in fact, Helen's going to read from two of her recent books, for the, for the most recent and I think the one before that, uh, insofar as they circle around this idea of Bloomsbury as a setting loosely understood both brooms we loosely understood and setting loosely understood for fiction. So uh, I think we're going to begin with David. Or we, no, we're going to begin with Helen. Sorry. But yeah, so let's begin with Helen and, um, uh, and then we'll move on to David and then we'll begin a discussion and I hope there'll be questions. Great. So uh, I'm going to read them to my Bloomsbury novel. Um, it's called Bloomsbury Inspector. It's set in no, yeah, that's fine. That's set in, uh, in Bloomsbury. So I'm going to read from that second. Um, but as an afterthought, because um, the event is being held here in the Ministry of Communication, I thought I'd, write, I'd read a, a very short bit from The Miracle Inspector where um, Lucas, who's The Miracle Inspector, goes to work in a building very much like this. Just a couple of pages that, um, that, that sets it up. And it's... it's a dystopian tale that's set in the near future and England has been divided and um, what happens in the story is a, a young married couple, a very young married couple end up uh, trying to flee London for a better life in Cornwall where they've heard that um, women are allowed to work outside the home. Lucas parked the car right outside the ministry building where he worked. It was difficult to imagine that the flaking yellow or red lines still visible along the edge of some of the streets he drove through, or the zebra stripes that spanned them, had once had some purpose other than purely decorative. That like the coloured lights on poles at the junctions, and the risibly childish symbols on the metal signs at the side of the road, they'd once been used to control the flow of traffic and to advise drivers about how and where to park. He could no more imagine streets full of traffic than he could imagine skies full of planes. He walked up the steps at the entrance to the ministry building and into the marble lobby where he nodded to the security guard before walking to the lift which would take him to the fourth floor. His office was in the nicest of the half a dozen ministry offices in central London which were now occupied by the many, many bureaucrats required to interpret London's eccentric laws. On the fourth floor, as Lucas walked down the long corridor towards his office, each brass plaque on each doorway he passed told something about the way London now functioned. Inspector of cats. Inspector of hedgerows and brass verges. Inspector of inventions and gadgets. Inspector of women and family relationships. The departments ranged from the esoteric to the worthy to the downright silly. And as he passed the fourth floor toilets, Lucas was amused to recall hearing that the reason there were two sets on every floor, one with urinals, one without, was because women had once been allocated toilets in every office in London. It seemed ludicrous. There was now a whole department tasked with agreeing what it meant to work outside the home, whether it was okay, for example, for women to work in other women's homes, or whether they were to be restricted to working in their own homes. There were all sorts of exceptions and loopholes which had to be debated, refined, and then policed. It ought to have been easy to sort out, but it wasn't so straightforward once they got into the detail, especially as there were so many amateurs at senior level, appointed because of nepotism and favouritism, 
and because so many competent civil servants had been imprisoned as suspected terrorists or, or paedophiles, or occasionally both. Last stop before Lucas's office was the Inspector of Women's Travel. It seemed as if every woman in London claimed somehow to be related to every other woman. It was the job of poor old Fielding next door to Lucas to keep track of which family relationships between women had been confirmed so that their visits to each other could be officially sanctioned. There was such a backlog that women crisscrossed all over London unofficially anyway, pending review of their cases. Men made the laws. Women set out to exploit the loopholes in them. Finally, Lucas reached the door to his office with its polished plaque, Inspector of Miracles. That's what, that one. Um, have we got the line for my second one, which is about the same thing. So, um, my newest book has got very different um, tone and style. It's, it's, um, it's a mystery full of, um, full of extravagant characters and over-the-top over -top situations, purely entertaining, not to be taken too seriously, featuring an amateur sleuth, 26-year-old Emily Castles, with dimples and freckles. Um, and she, um, she's asked to help out with the administration at a romance authors convention in Bloomsbury in London. And um, I, I set it in Bloomsbury actually because I, I, this is the third time I've taken uh, part in an event here. And I was hosting something as part of the Bloomsbury Festival two years ago and we were looking around to find a suitable venue. And I think that put the seed in my mind that um, maybe I should set the book at, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a version of the Russell Hotel, but it's um, the layout and all the meeting room names are um, my own invention, uh, and it's called the Coram Hotel. So again, it's, just, it's, a couple of, it's a couple of pages. The day was drearily damp when Emily arrived at the Coram Hotel in Bloomsbury. Her short dark hair was neatly combed. Her shoes were new, but comfortable to stand in. She was wearing her best coat, and she was carrying a small case she'd packed with a requisite amount of underwear, some smart clothes for the, for the daytime, and a flattering dead dress for dinner. The hotel was an enormous Gothic structure fashioned from salmon-colored bricks. The sky above it was gray as a slab of pan-fried tuna. From the street, it was impossible to tell what it would be like inside. It might be musty and mildewy, more hostile than hotel. But the salute from the elegant doorman, who touched his right hand to the brim of his grey bowler hat as Emily arrived, hinted at lavish interiors and first-class service beyond the heavy door he held open for her. Emily felt her shoulders relax as she went through into the dark calm of the hotel, the cool air spicy with the perfume of long-stemmed lilies. This weekend was going to be as relaxing as a spa break, a much-needed antidote to the stress of working in the cutthroat environment of London's financial district. And obviously, you know that's not going to happen because it's called Invitation to Die and it starts with murder. But Emily didn't think of herself as a fanciful person, but she sometimes had fanciful thoughts. As she stepped through the doors into the immaculately artificial, recently restored lobby of the hotel, the furniture, carpets, mirrors, even the air, apparently very slightly heavier and richer than anything anyone would have at home. Emily had, the, had an impression of unreality, as if she'd stepped through a portal into a previous age. She looked out again at the mackerel grey streets, at the present day people striding past, heads down against the wind, their slightly bitter expressions suggesting they'd expected the day to turn out better than this, and saw that the world was just as she'd left it. Emily saw Morgana waiting for her in the lobby and went over to meet her. Morgana was wearing a very smart powder blue velveteen trouser suit, a fluffy blue angora berry atop her head. Silver bangles jingled on her wrists as she turned to give Emily a kiss on the, che on the cheek. With the jingling and the soft appealing jumble of textures she was wearing in blue, Emily thought that Morgana would have made an excellent educational toy for a baby. But irreverence and unemployment are not a good mix. So Emily tried to compose herself and think business-like thoughts. Let me introduce you to the others, Morgana said, and turned and walked very, very fast through the hotel's opulent interior, Emily beside her. Emily looked to left and right, taking in glimpses of silk-patterned wallpaper, silk-upholstered furniture, uniform staff, tall vases, short tables, stopped clocks, and a gilt barometer as Morgana briefed her about the conferences and its attendees. 
and then they reached the mahogany, the mahogany lined bar. It featured a huge ceiling high mirror, its reflection doubling the range, the range of wines and spirits is ava available behind the well stocked bar, and giving the white shirted, French looking bar steward a twin. Emily briefly saw her twin there too, short dark hair, freckles, dimples, an eager expression, and nice, strong little chin. Beyond her own reflection, Emily saw Morgana's fellow committee members in the mirror. Three of them, two women and a man, sat at a low round table in the hotel bar, eating steak and horseradish sandwiches in crusty white bread, the bloody red juices from the meat running down their fingers as though they'd just taken part in a ritual killing. That's it. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Can everyone hear all right? Let's put the specs on. Um, <clears throat> I'm just going to read you two or three pages, um, two or three Bloomsbury set pages from the Windsor Faction, which is, as, uh, as Matt McCartney said, is my novel currently out. Um, it's, it's a counterfactual historical novel, by which I mean that it's an exercise in what might have been rather than what really was. And the counterfactual premise on which it rests is the idea that Wallace Simpson dies in 1936. So there's no abdication, the eighth remains on the throne. We are at war with Nazi Germany, but the monarch is arguably slightly more immoderately disposed to the idea of continental dictatorships. And the faction of the title is a kind of uh, right-wing pacifist ginger group that's at work to derail the war using the king. Now, <clears throat> the, well, the central character of this book is a woman called, a girl called Cynthia Kirkpatrick, who comes back from Ceylon, where her father's a colonial administrator. And um, in the, the uncertain early days of the war, what was known as the phony war, um, it gets, gets a job working in Bloomsbury as a, an editorial assistant on a literary magazine called Duration, uh, which is quite sort of almost sort of based on Cyril Connolly's Horizon magazine, which you know, was also um, had its offices around here. And um, although the square in which its, its offices are, are located is never mentioned, it's supposed to be, it's North Bloomsbury, it's somewhat like Golden Square. So I'm just going to read you three pages of the atmosphere of the duration offices in late 1939 as the magazine is, is getting ready to print its first number. <clears throat> there was fog hanging over the square, which meant that the houses at the northernmost end had almost disappeared. The handful that remained to view, those of whose rectangular windows lights burned, <clears throat> or where the wisps of vapour clung less densely to the stucco frontages, produced an oddly variegated effect, like the last remaining stumps in a mouth otherwise with clean and tea. Here and there, their noise hardly audible, such was the height at which she sat, a few cars crawled in and out of the murmur. The square lay in Bloomsbury's furthest quadrant, its ultimate fuel, Desmond used to say, and was in the process of having its gardens dug up for the war effort, so that any time of the day, three or four labourers in bolstering trousers and open net shirts might be seen hacking away at the bushes with antique billboards, or making bonfires out of the swept up branches. There was a self-conscious deliberation about the men as they went about these tasks. Like artist models, they were bent on exaggerating their picturesqueness, and the trips they made across the curbside, pushing loaded wheelbarrows, were mostly intended to disrupt the traffic. Occasionally, lorries came and took the less flammable debris away. To the north, where the mists had begun to disperse, a barrage balloon hung tethered over Euston Square, like one of those fat cigars you saw men smoking at taxi ranks while they read the evening paper. Only these days there seemed to be fewer cigars and fewer men to smoke them. And none of this, she thought, fog, desecrated gardens, or barrage balloons, boded well. The magazine's offices were on the third floor of a house, otherwise occupied by a doctor, a dentist, and a red lead company. High ceiling, the tall window, but somehow never catching the light so that even on the days when there was no fog, they had a curiously submarine quality, as if everything in them were washing around under water, and the desks might float up to join the light fittings unless they were weighed down. They'd only been here a week, and the headed note paper had still to arrive from the printer, which meant that letters had to be sent out with duration typed at the top of the page using the red ribbon. The magazine was bound to be a success, people said, because the cinemas were closed, and there was nothing else for pleasure seekers to do in the evenings except read. Another advantage was that all Desmond's friends would be writing for it. Cynthia had one of these sheets of paper in her typewriter now, but had stopped looking at it in favour of the barrage balloon. It seemed to her an extraordinarily sinister thing, frightful to behold, but dangerous to ignore, leaving you in an endless, disagreeable limbo, frightened by the implications of what you looked at, but always conscious of its absence if you looked away. Somewhere above her head there was a stifled cry, but she was used to the noise of the dentist performing extractions, and merely shook her head. 
And from the desk in the room's furthest corner, squeezed between a bookcase crammed with review copies and a table full of tea-making equipment, Lucy looked up from the story she was translating from the French and said, I say, do you know what escuniers are? I don't think I do. Is there a hint? Well, it sounds rather rude. Avec grande excitation, il commence à caresser ses escuniers. Does it say what's happened before? As far as I can make out, Jules and Ernestine are in the garden listening to the nightingales. There was a sound of sharp, obtrusive movement, like an animal blundering around in the dark, and the door of the second of the two inner offices that faced out into the big workroom flew open and then swung rapidly back and forth, rather simply a thought than the way that saloon doors flapped in cowboy films. The Desmond loomed in the doorway. There was a coffee cup sunk into the red flesh of his fist, and he was smoking a cheroot. It means buttocks, he said. With great excitement, he begins to stroke her buttocks. Put bottom if you're feeling squeamish. Thanks, Des, Lucy said. I'm not in the least squeamish. Of all people alive, you ought to know that. Buttocks it is. Everyone had agreed at the outset they would not turn a hair at anything Desmond said. This was a sort of some annoyance to him, as he got most of his pleasure from the effect he had on other people. When no one rose to the bait, he grew petulant and went back into his office to sulk. He was a short, stoutish man in his late thirties, with a large, half-bald head, who had written an autobiography about how unhappy he'd been at school and at university, how his first wife had never loved him, and how difficult it was to find the time to write anything. Inexplicably, this had made his reputation, and now quite famous people rang up to ask him to dinner. In his fawn coloured jacket and his red check shirt, there was also something Irish about him. He looked, Cynthia thought, that he ought to be standing in the market square in Ennis on a Sunday morning after Mass, waiting for the pubs to open. She was deeply in awe of him, as she was of Lucy, the typewriter on the desk before her, and it did anything to do with duration, but she thought that so far she'd managed to hide this anxiety pretty well. Do you know, Desmond said, still lingering in the doorway, and doubting the shoot and the coffee cup, that they painted over all the glass paint of the roof of the Wembley dog track the other day? Apparently it cost them three hundred pounds. He was always desperate for conversation, but it never sunk quite so low as this. Why should they want to do that? Lucy wondered. Well, they wanted to see if they could get it to conform to the blackout regulations. But then they discovered there wasn't to be any greyhound racing, blackout or no blackout. Three hundred pounds, I ask you. Most of Desmond's utterances reverted in the end to money. What I couldn't do with that? Do you know it's going to cost nearly twice that amount to produce every 5,000 copies of the magazine? We're getting an awful lot of subscription inquiries, Lucy said encouragingly. There are at least another 50 this morning. Don't tell me about the kind of people who subscribe to literary magazines, Desmond said. He looked peevish when he dashed out of his office. Now he seems still more ground down, practically tragic. After all, I used to be one of them myself. He waited to see if anyone would laugh, but had no luck. I say, though, has anyone seen Anthea? Only I need her to help me break open the petty cash tip. Thank you both uh, very much indeed. Um, so uh, we'll begin a discussion with a couple of questions I have, and, uh, and then I'll open it up to you. Um, I wanted to ask questions for both of them uh, about, I suppose, the historical imagination particular reference to Bloomsbury um, and the way in which we exercise our historical imagination when writing or reading fiction. Sitting in Senate House today, um, I'm reminded that it was, when it was built in the 30s, it was the second biggest, second tallest building in London uh, after St Paul's, and uh, which today seems completely extraordinary, seems baffling, um, because when you head up, uh, you know, heading through from Gower Street today, uh, there's something rather strangely squat about about this building, even though it does cast a relatively long shadow across Georgian and Victorian Bloomsbury. So I suppose the question I want to ask both of them, and I'll, I'll, I'll make it slightly more specific in turn, is how we reproduce the, uh, the, the, the kind of freshness of perception of a particular place, a particular space in trying to write about it or in trying to read about it. So perhaps if I start with Helen and go back to your a phrase that you used um, <coughs> it comes from Invitation to Die, where you talk, I think, about stepping out of a portal uh, into another age. I mean, I wondered, transferring that to the miracle aspect of your novel set in the future, how, how does one, how do you do that? How do you step out of, as a writer, how do you step out of, um, of a portal? into another age, in this case into a future age, so for example in writing about a building not unlike uh, Senate House. So I think with all my stories, um, what I'm saying to the reader is 
look, this is just the way I see it. And um, I would like you to see it, see it through my eyes. So, um, so I, I don't like too much description when I'm reading. So you, you need to use some description though to, to try and give a sense of place and to try and, um, it, it helps sometimes to use, to use something that people might be familiar with and show them that you're looking at it slightly differently. So even that little bit in the bar, um, that's the first time you meet that character, Emily, and it's going to be told very much through her eyes. Um, she's the one who, um, the, the, it's, it's, it's a mystery, but I mean, it, it doesn't have to, it, you could say that any, any book's got an element of mystery or romance, or, you know, um, it's got, that's, that's the structure of it. Um, so I'm just saying that you might have been in a bar like that, but and have you, have you thought that um, here we are? I'm, I'm showing you that um, that it's a slightly surreal place seen through Emily's eyes with um, with the bar and with the barman, and then his twin, and then she sees her own uh, her own twin, and then she sees these people who are all going to be the suspects in the mystery, but she sees them first through the mirror. So I'm trying to I'm trying to um, without being too heavy-handed about it because. Most people are going to skim through it and think, well, that's uh, what a lovely mystery is, uh, what a lovely British mystery, and not think too hard about it. But um, that's what I'm trying to do, is, um, is, is use something familiar and try and make it look slightly um, unusual without, without going to, like, well, there's a unicorn. Um, and so I did that with both of those. Um, I had written about a place that, as I, uh, going back to the Miracle Inspector, um, you don't see very much about the place where Lucas works, um, but I, but it, it was just something I made it up from having from having been past and thought it's, it's, it's amazing. I didn't realise that actually that it was the second most high building um, for all that time. It seems crazy because as I was as I came from Russell Square trying to find it, um, I was looking, thinking, I know I'm looking for this tall building. I haven't been you know I haven't been in here several times. And it's very easy for it to get lost. So that's so that's so that's 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 my answer. Um, that you're very good question. You're also interested in the way in which um, exteriors promise interiors, and the way in which interiors fulfil or contradict yes, the exterior. It, I mean, in the case of the hotel that you described. Yeah. So I wonder what um, I mean, if, as it were, you were to provide a more detailed description of the interior of the office of Lucas, yes. the inspector. How would you? Uh, how would you relate that to your sense of it from the outside? Yeah, the, and the way the book is structured is, in the um, first half of it, um, you see everything from his point of view. And it's, a, it's a world that's, that's ruled by men, and he's very young, and so he's got no experience whatsoever. But you hear all his external, um, his, his, all his internal thoughts, he can't really make sense of anything, and he's not very wise. And then, um, and then we, we transfer to, to seeing much more about Angela, his wife. Um, so, the, so the answer to that is really that um, I think that what what people are trying to, and it's like every, every cliche or truism about the way the world functions, it's nevertheless is true that all of us are trying to um, present some kind of exterior or some give some sort of clue to how we really are, whether it's um, the, um, the way we make up, the way we decorate our house or how we dress or how we speak, um, and that um, you can always find people out by, by seeing the disconnect between how they see themselves and how everyone else is perceived. As for how his, um, as for how his, the decoration of his office, I think that what I really wanted to do, and borrowing probably a bit from Terry um, Gillen's film Brazil, which I really loved, um, and in fact probably um, most Dystopian stories that are that are written in the present day is is the idea that everything's really old-fashioned in it. So you've, so that's why he's got the, 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 the even though it's set in the near future, um, there's a real fifties feel to it. Um, so all of those there's just tiny little clues, but give a clue to the way that it functions, which is that, that um, they they you know his wife is having to live like a 1950s housewife, except in Iran. Uh, and if, if I could now sort of turn, turn to David and ask a similar question about uh, the role of the historical imagination. I mean, it, it's a peculiar challenge, I suppose, writing a counterfactual history, a historical fiction which deviates from historical 
fact, because in a sense, the textures, the historical textures, become even more important as a way of uh, providing a kind of uh, support, material support, if you like, for the claims, the fictive claims that you make. Um, so I wonder if you'd say something about the extent to which you were conscious in writing about Bloomsbury and about this square, perhaps Gordon Square, and about the office building in it, of that, that need, that imperative to provide a qualitatively different kind of historical detail and texture, uh, given, the, given the counterfactual claims that you're making across the narrative. I think you're right. That is a kind of imperative when you're writing this sort of fiction. But the thing about historic counterfactual fiction is an interesting animal. I've never written a book like this before. It was a very interesting challenge. And there's, a, there's a classic, I think, distinction to be made between dystopian fiction, which Helen talked about, and counterfactual fiction. Dystopian fiction is future shock, in 1984, for example, which of course much of which is said in this very building. Um, everything's gone wrong, and uh, so thus giving the novelist a completely free hand and enabling him or her to make up almost everything. With counterfactual, I was liking the effect to um, a chessboard where you've taken out one of the 32 pieces, and so the other 31 have to recalibrate themselves in the knowledge that they're all the same, it's just that one thing has changed. It's so very counterfactual fiction. One thing has altered, in this case, is a different king on the throne, but everything else is the same. The politicians are the same, the political imperatives are the same, the um, historical you know, landscape is the same. Um, and this, in, in, specific, in specific terms of using this area and, and, and making it work as a kind of theatre of fiction, this is quite fascinating, because on the one hand, I mean, we are in the middle of the, the two or three square miles of London through which I can barely walk through a single street without thinking of the literature either written in it or about it. You know, I mean, we're in the heart of Thackeray country. He actually wrote a short story called The Bedford Row Conspiracy, which is set just down there. Um, Gissing lived in Gower Street, Dickens lived in Doughty Street, just back over that way is Spitzrovia, where McLaren Moss and the wartime poets and Dylan Thomas Carrow. So you were right in the middle of everything from a literary point of view. Um, but in, in terms of the, the kind of historical, and this of course was a great, still is in some ways, the London Review of Books is still here. It was, this, was, this always was a great area for the literary magazine, the little bookshop, the publishing company, uh, that kind of thing. And um, the, what, I, what I did in this particular instance, and the literary magazine in this novel is, is not in the direction of sort of Conley's Horizon, which was the great magazine of the 1940s, the print of War and Orwell, and the first stories of Angus Wilson, and people like that. And, um, <clears throat> But interestingly enough, the, the name that I gave, give to my magazine here is Duration. Now, Duration, curiously enough, was the name of a magazine that Evelyn Waugh wanted to found at the beginning of the Second World War. The idea being that it would last, you know, it would, it would go, however long the war lasted, there would be a magazine called Duration. And um, unfortunately, Connolly got in first, and Waugh was furious, and was then himself called up. Uh, and, and went off to fight, whereas Connolly, as a magazine editor, was in, uh, managed to get into reserved occupation territory. And so I thought, well, let's just sort of swap this around. Let's use some of the features of an existing paper that existed in Bloomsbury in the 1940s, but let's just alter it and give it, you know, give it a name, Pluck from the Street, Literary History was a different one. So you may, as a reader, as a potential reader, find all this kind of mucking around tiresome, but in fact, I, I quite enjoy playing around with these kind of, this, this sort of historical backdrop, just altering it subtly. And in fact, of course, most of the people who write for duration in the novel are, you know, real named literary people. And people are always saying, where's that review of the Walpole? Has to be as Pritchard run up this, this kind of thing. But I think that's quite important because the thing about counterfactual history is that although I find readers enjoy the, you know, the, the kind of challenge, the idea of the, the, the what if, I, I think the whole counterfactual idea is very important to the individual psychology. I mean, we all sit there thinking, oh, if only I'd gone to such and such university, if only I'd married so and so instead of you know, such and such. I think that's quite an important thing. And, and so the reader doesn't, although the reader, I think, is quite interested in these kind of subjunctive historical situations, he or she doesn't want to be too confused. So it has to be kind of familiar territory. You can't invent a whole load of writers that nobody's ever heard of, in the same way that you can't invent a whole lot of politicians that nobody's ever heard of. Otherwise, the reader gets confused and thinks, well, this isn't just kind of an alternate world. It's a completely different world, which I don't understand. So it, it, it does, not it does, I think, require quite a, quite a bit of care and sort of forethought to do. And as a writer, I mean, you know Bloomsbury well, obviously, and you've know, written about the literary denizens of Bloomsbury before. Do you, are you conscious when reconstructing the, uh, the 
background to the, to the novel. Uh, what, Chris, are you conscious of actively researching it? I mean, do you have you, have you revisited Bloomsbury houses in Golden Square, say, in order to? I don't. Think, I, I have to be perfectly honest and say that I don't think I have. This is always the the question, I suppose, for people who presume to write historical fiction, which is, you know, do you go out there and hunt the streets in search of your location? Do you read every book in the London Library about your particular people? I'm afraid I don't. And in fact, they're not. Um, in some ways, I, I, I fear that these are slightly bogus historical novels because such research that I do is not generally based on the history of the time, but it's based on the literature of the time. And I'm quite prepared to admit that this is a very, very stylized perspective. And that if you get your knowledge of the literary, of the historical period by reading the imaginative literature that it produced, then you're likely to get a rather peculiar vision. But then, um, you know, all views of the, of the past are slightly indicular. Uh, indicular. We all bring our own suppositions and prejudices and coins of vantage to them. So, um, from that perspective, I don't think that my view of it is, is you know, particularly tarnished. Whereas, a professional historian will probably sort of throw up his hands in horror and say that I got it completely wrong. And the echoes you're seeing are echoes of novels by Anthony Cole and Henry Green and Elizabeth Bowen, rather than the actual historical background of the period. But I, I, you know, that's just how I work, I'm afraid. Uh, I mean, I'm, I suspect other people share my relief as a reader. I mean, you know, nothing is worse than a historical novel which is so overloaded with. Uh, oh, I absolutely with agree. The historical novelist who wears his, his or her research like a, like a lapel badge, I think it, it's. Um, it, it, it really just sort of destroys the pleasure of, the, of, the, of the, you know, actually watching the action unfold. I think, you can, I think you can do too much research. And in fact, I, I was just, um, I, I heard in advance, um, in fact, I, it's not, it hasn't been broadcast yet, but there's a very good program about the novelist, the late novelist, Penelope Fitzgerald on Radio 4. On, um, she also wrote about the area around right here on Radio 4 next Thursday. And somebody made the point that Penelope Fitzgerald managed to, to write novels about the Soviet Revolution. Uh, German Romanticism, Cambridge of the early 20th century, in 200 pages. And she did this because she thought that if you absolutely, you know, you over garnished your work with historical detail and patronized the reader, who was quite capable of inferring stuff rather than having paragraph after paragraph of, you know, how, about how, about how handkerchiefs were manufactured in the 19th century every time somebody blows their nose. Um, and have you got uh, either of you, I mean, uh, novels or pictures one kind or another written and set in Bloomsbury that you uh, are fond of or, or, or think of when you write? Speculative is going to be a lot longer than fun. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I was going to, I would not answer that question though, but um, just um, pick up a point that, that, that you made, you can you can be honest, I've just brought up with, which is that um, I think that if you, if, that reading fiction informs how, you know, how you, how you understand other fiction so that there becomes, um, um, and it's, it's it's the same whether it's books or whether or not you're watching films on TV. They become conventions that that you ignore at your peril because everyone assumes that's how it's done. So you know. So in fact, the idea that you that you would t take a lot of your learning from from literature um, makes perfect sense. In the same way, I had a, a brilliant. Uh, but but was when it starts um, informing real life, then you're in trouble. Because I had a, a brilliant anecdote which was by. The designer Ken Adam, who who designed um, the, did the set designs for a lot of uh, James Bond films in the 60s. But he also did the Doctor Strange Love um, film, which is where mm. Peter Sellers was playing everyone. Um, and they had a they had a they had a war room, um, at which you know which looked great and looked exactly as a war room should look. But apparently, when Ronald Reagan went into the White House uh, for the first time as president, they showed him around and you know here's this and this will be your office and. He actually said, "Well, where's the war room?" And they said, "Well, no, that was in film." Um, so, but but I, but, but I and you also you often hear that in, in police dramas though, where you don't really you don't want the actual procedure. You know, you want something that's that's believable and that takes the story along. So you can get you can get bogged down by saying, "Oh no, well actually, you know, they would have they would have done this in that in that, in that time." And so then it becomes something. That isn't fiction it becomes something that's oh, too dynamic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The artist yes. gets inversed. Yeah, will codify and modify the name. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, okay, this okay book look, novel set in Bloomsbury. Um, there's all there's all of Thackeray's early short stories for a start. Let's say there's the Bedford Road conspiracy. There's a marvelous <coughs> series of um, uh, in fact, 
He's one of the first kind of sorters, but along with Sam Weller, one of the great early Victorian servants in literature, which is the Yellow Plush Papers, which is the memoirs of Sir Charles James Yellow Plush, called Yellow Plush because of his, uh, his, 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 his livery, his livery trousers, you see, who's, uh, who's a servant living in a house very, very near to here. Um, there's a lot of, um, I say Gissing used to live in a garret at the top of Court Road, quite a bit of his early stuff is set around here. Moving into the 20th century, one of my favourite gamey, sort of sleazy London novelists in the 1960s is Simon Raven, and uh, Simon Raven's uh, sleazy advertising agencies and his little magazines and his publishing firms are all established around here. There's a couple of Simon Raven novels called The Rich Pay Late and Friends in Low Places, which are all about you know, wandering around in the Bloomsbury fog and on Friday afternoon with cell doggery going on, uh, and this kind of thing. I think it's a, an extraordinary kind of um, evocative milieu around here for writing anything. I mean, I've always, my wife laughs about this, and just as apparently when, when Kingsley Amos at the end of his life would really only read a novel that began with the words a shot rang out. You know, so so I, I always maintain if, if, a, if a book begins with the words outside it, outside in the Bloomsbury Square it was raining, the literary editor said, I would just think, oh, it's got everything I want, it's got books, <laughs> melancholia, and it's got London WC1, which is, you know, always seemed to be an utterly wonderful setting. But it, but yeah, the thing is, you see, that historically, not, not that obviously literature reflects this pattern, historically, looking at the early 19th century, when the kind of London fictions I'm interested in began to be written by the likes of Dickens and, and Thacker and people like that, and Bloomsbury, although towards the end of the 19th century, it, it acquired this very serious veneer of intellectuals. I mean, Rosemary Ashton has just written this book called Victorian Bloomsbury, which details the kind of intellectual alliances between various people who lived in big houses in the square. But before that time, Bloomsbury was a kind of sort of a halfway house. It was shabby genteel, to use another Thackeray phrase, a shabby genteel story. You, on the one hand, you had you had the flesh pots of Soho to one side. You had the, the sort of more grand parts of London, not the Oxford Street and the big noblesman's mansions. You had the sort of working class rookeries to east and north. And in the middle, you had this kind of shabby genteel area where people who were trying to keep themselves respectable lived. I mean, the whole point about C.J. Yellowplush in the Thackeray stories is that he's, he's a servant to a family that has seen better days, but they're keeping on to their manservant. And so the manservant's livery breaches, the yellow plush, is a kind of symbol of how they're trying to keep socially their heads above water. So in that respect, Bloomsbury is a very kind of symbolic London area of the 19th century. It's a halfway house between serious money and you know, low level depravity. It's, it's, it's full of people, uh, sort of chances and opportunities to try and keep their heads above water. That's why I find it so interesting as a place of fiction. I mean. No, I mean, I agree. I think it's, it's, it's social ambiguity mm. historically that makes it interesting that people are either on the way up quite rapidly or they're on the way down mm. quite rapidly. Agree. And it's the, it's the tension between those two dynamics and it's the circulation of those two kinds of and it and you, you continue. I mean, I always remember I used to like when I started hanging around on the fringes of literary London, which is long, long decades ago now, about 30 years ago. And I used to hang out at the Spectator, which in those days, which had, a, had offices in Doughty Street, at you know, the heart of Bloomsbury. And you're quite right. You had exactly this juxtaposition of, um, you know, extremely elevated people and, and much more kind of subterranean ones. And I always remember a wonderful occasion. The, the, the deputy editor of the Spectator in those days. Uh, was back with Simon Courtauld, as in Courtauld, you know, who once said to me that I once said to him, I enjoyed reading your diary poem, Simon. He said, Oh, it's America was done, I was frightfully ill, I had to dictate it to the maid. <laughs> and on one occasion, on one occasion, one of the journalists had written a piece about the Richardsons, you know, the South London criminal gang, um, in the 1960s, and actually he was threatened, you know, had some kind of intimation that you'd better watch out for his kneecaps or his wife and children and so forth. And the pub, the spectator pub around the corner where they went at lunchtime, was, if not run by a former gangster, then by someone who had definite East End connections. But anyway, Simon Courtauld, as in Courtauld, was dispatched round the corner to see if he could put a word in, you know, because <laughs> so he arrived at the pub. As we said to the landlord, do you think, do you think, uh, Dave, you think you could uh, just put the word round and sort of get, you know, have, have Richard sort of left alone? To which the landlord said, I'd love to help you, Simon, it's not my manner. <laughs> I thought, this is perfect, this could only have happened. In Bloomsbury, where even then, 30 years ago, you can get this interlingling of the hierarchy. It's fascinating. Um, it's also, I mean, not just in, in, in social terms, but in, uh, in, in, 
can it turn to its topography, it's quite ambiguous proving to bring, and I think that's been exploited by fiction. I mean, not only the you know the very mixed housing, you know, garrets on the one hand and tenements with very poor people and rather grand aspirant houses, but also because of the presence of the of the squares themselves and of the gardens, uh, which have often been historically sort of disputed territory. There have often been you know, territorial battles, as it were, where the rich residents of uh, have tried to keep the poor and the unwashed and the homosexuals out um, and the homeless and, and all forms of undesirable. So, so it's been a site not just of social ambiguity but of class conflict, I think. Um, I, we should probably, um, uh, time's getting on, I'm conscious of that, so perhaps um, we can open it out. If anyone has um, any questions, we could... Yeah, yeah well, this is called uh, Lutering in Temple Fiction. And uh, both you, neither of the novels, I believe, that you discussed, maybe one of yours, but, but one was set in the past, one was set in the future. And, and I wondered what, if you could identify anything about Bloomsbury today, the contemporary Bloomsbury, that would actually sort of, what's the flavour of Bloomsbury now? What kind of ideas would we have? This is, this is interesting, you know, this is because I've watched, I, 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 I came to live in London 30 years ago, 1983, when I came out of college. And I worked in Newman Street, which is not in Bloomsbury, Street, it's over there in Fitzrovia, not the Oxford Street. But I used to hang around here. And the, the way that Bloomsbury has changed, uh, you probably have even more of a view on this than I have actually sort of teaching here. The way it's changed is that 30 years ago, it was publishing land. I mean, Bedford Square, which is sort of down there, Jonathan Cape, Edward Arnold, there were four or five you know, major publishers actually had their offices there in times before you know, publishing conglomerates came in and it was all sort of much more international and big business. And uh, the other thing you, and, and you also, the, um, so there was a publishing flavour, there was obviously, it was not just uh, an academic flavour because of the London universities, but it was the kind of place where all, lo lots of um, American universities had what they called their London semesters. So it was always full of American students wandering around going to lecture. I used to come to, sometimes get asked to come and talk to 200 American students about the state of the English novel. But I think this is changing. See, the publishers, or, or rather it's changing, and in some cases there's a sense of renaissance. All the publishers moved out. I mean, Jonathan Cape, for example, became part of Random House and went to the Vauxhall Bridge Road. But just recently I've noticed that the publishers seem to be coming back to Bloomsbury. I mean, Constable, a small independent firm, just got to take an office in Russell Square. There's a kind of sense in which there's been a diaspora of the original sort of publishing intellectual side of Bloomsbury, which is now being renewed. I don't know what you, what you so I mean, I, it's, 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 to me, it's got, you know, it, it's, it's got, why it's, I think it would be you know, great to set a contemporary novel here now, it's got that combination of sort of braininess and bohemianism and that, that shading between, as Matt was saying, very rich people, very, very poor people as well. I mean, you've got much more of a microcosm, I think, uh, than you have in other parts of, you know, other parts of central London. So that would be my tip. I might be completely wrong to have lived in London for a dozen years. They just be complete. Uh, yeah, so, so I, uh, I, I chose to set it in Bloomsbury, partly, as I say, sort of wandering around here a couple of years ago and sort of being recharmed by it all. But also because um, it, I wanted to have, I wanted to choose somewhere that would be familiar to, um, instantly familiar to American readers who might never get the chance to, to come here. But a lot of American tourists, when they come to London, they will come and stay in the Bloomsbury area. It's one, it's one of those areas they've, they've heard of and it sounds charming, but it, they can actually end up somewhere that's a little bit shabby if they're not careful. Um, and because, because there is still that shabbiness in, in Bloomsbury. And so um, what happens in my book, Invitation to Die, which is set in the present day, but it, 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 it's, um, it's written along the lines of a, of a golden age, um, traditional British mystery um, is that an American blogger is lured to her death. Um, she's um, she wins a prize that, that enables her to come and stay in this hotel in Bloomsbury, and she thinks uh, you know launch her um, her future as a, as a writer. And um, there is uh, because it's set in uh, even because it's set in present day London, and, and all my books um, apart from the very newest one, which isn't out yet, have London up. Uh, 
uh, are set in London. Um, so my first two, I live in Brixton, my first two are about a woman who joins an all-female detective agency in Brixton, which is a, a charming and fascinating, very ethnically diverse place. And uh, in this, um, in Invitation to Die, there is something of that uh, conflict. So, that, so there's, uh, there's this plush hotel, and we just had some description of that, but um, it backs onto a huge, slightly rough council estate. And um, they try and pin the murder um, initially um, on people from that estate, uh, many, of whom, uh, many of the workers come from there. So um, the workers are, are, are immigrants um, who are poor. I mean, it sounds very heavy, it's only it's a really short book. But you know, there's all those little elements that, that we're all familiar with in, in the London or the Bloomsbury of today. So they try and, uh, the hotel manager tries to pin it on a drug deal that's gone wrong, and she's just a, a, a very nice, um, 35-year-old woman from Hartford, Connecticut. So obviously she hasn't been buying drugs. Um, so there are some of those, some of those London contemporary um, elements. To I mean, I think if you try and uh, if you try and write a book set in London and you don't have people with different ethnic backgrounds and um, different um, different outlooks on life, then you kind of miss the whole point of, of living here. So so there are some of those. Some of those, I would say, particularly London elements, but as a microcosm, that's that's in in Bloomsbury. Anyway, yeah. We've actually, what you said, we've quite forgotten. We've forgotten an entire genre of fiction, which uh, which has its sort of location and its creators barely half a mile away, which is the British Museum, of course, which is a huge sort of fount of not only a novelist's work there, but the number of novels I can think of that are either set or about the British Museum. There's a wonderful one by David Lodge called the British Museum's Falling Down in the 1960s. Uh, much of Gissing's New Grub Street, of course, is set there. It's, um, you know, you see, and there was another, you know, all these novels at the time was like Other the Dome and, and this, this kind of thing. I mean, the idea of there being this kind of intellectual centre here, which which, calls, which is, you know, which is full of sort of dialogue being inspiring writers who are trying to write their, their, their fictions, I think. Is that, that's something else that gives it its resonance, which I'm afraid I've forgotten about. Uh, <laughs> For, for what it's worth, my sense is that Bloomsbury is on the turn at the moment, and I think in the next sort of 10 years it's going to change quite a lot. And I think that's for pressing political reasons. I think that you know the cap on benefits and the rising rents in central London are going to push, are going to change this very mixed social uh, topography, which is characteristic of, uh, of Bloomsbury at the moment and has been for such a long time. Uh, and it's going to push working class people out. And the planners are going to move in, luxury flats are going to appear, and, uh, and the universities and, the, and the, sort of the big institutions are going to expand as well. And I think we can, so I think the social composition is about to change a lot. Um, I think we can see already hints of that in the way in which the, the dead hand of the planners has descended on the spot right outside where I work, up, so up the road, which is um, sort of Torrington Place, where Torrington Place, where Waterstones is, meets. Uh, Gordon Square, where they've they've turned it into a kind of beach. They've uh, they, they've blurred the difference between the pavement and the road, um, and which is perhaps no bad thing because it, it uh, means that people driving have to be a little bit more careful. So there, there are these cy there are cyclists and pedestrians and cars all all circulating about this space, but actually it's a completely dead space. It's a dead space designed by people who've never inhabited that space, and you can tell that it seems to me because the benches that they've installed, that they've sort of cemented into the ground, the chairs and benches, which are meant to, apparently to encourage people to sit and have their sandwiches and communicate with one another at lunch, are set at an impossible distance from one another. So oh. still, they're, they're, they're in a gap of about two feet, which means that when you sit in them, you have to lean forward in an extremely uncomfortable way to communicate with the people in the other seat. And it's, it's quite clearly a design. Sorry, I'm writing a hobby. It, it's quite clearly a design that's been scaled up from an architect's model on a, on a screen. Um, and there is, there is, it, it, it's all about supposedly humanizing a space that had lots of traffic in it. In fact, it's an utterly sterile and dehumanized space. And I'm afraid I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Um, did you, I mean, do you, do you have a sense of what Bloomsbury is like now? The zeitgeist in Google into uh, Well, it's very difficult because I live here. <laughs> so I'm, I'm like passing the fish, it's like passing official water like. mm -hmm. <laughs> um, So, well, what's the view? What's the view from inside the, the bowl? Yeah, 
yeah, some, 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 going down, some going down, some going down. And I'm puzzled by that space as well. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I hate the things outside. <laughs> My friend, we're talking about personal things. Bits of landscape that we hate. It's actually um, oh, these these things the Camden are putting um, outside. You go down across Great Green Street, that's on the right hand side, before you get into Longacre. And there are these horrible things that look like grid bins, but made of concrete, and they're supposed to be benches. And they've got bits of it buildings, and I quite love them, but it's just all those. But that's not really a literary thing, that's not really a good kind of statement. The story was a book. <laughs> Bastion book. Yeah, exactly. Are there other questions, either about the novels? I mean, we don't have to stick strictly to. Um, you've both written uh, these very songs that have got a big idea there, but I wanted to ask you about your, um, in the process of writing, in the, the groups of gestation period, you know, sort of the wisps and sparks and whatever, the, 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 the very first sort of intimations and inklings of these projects for both of you, were, were those ideas? So how, how soon did they form? Did, did, uh, did they actually kind of crystallise as well? It's like, okay, this is the canvas back from the river, this is the same people who kind of from quite early on, or were you exploring around other things and then found, found the, the I always wanted to write a novel about every age. I think it's fascinating. The idea that what happened, what would have been, it was such a momentous event in 1936. You know, my, my grandparents had the coronation mark, the coronation that never happened. I think a lot of people's grandparents probably did. So the, 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 the all sense that you know the world is going to go along that road. Oh no, it's suddenly not. It's not going to go that one simply because a man wanted to marry a woman that the British public couldn't, couldn't stand for, which was essentially the you know the, start. the politicians began, or some of the politicians began by thinking that they could simply support the the aid through this. Uh, and, you know, there was the talk about the woman of his choice, and then they found what the public thought about it, and they realised that it just wasn't viable. She could never be queen. The public wouldn't except an American twice divorced lady, you know, who sort of pinched our queen as the song went, would ever be would ever be acceptable. Having said that, I'm the last, I'm afraid that I'm the last person in the world to ask about the conceptual basis of the fiction I like, uh, the fiction I write, and the, 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 the um, I apologize if anyone has seen me speak before or has heard this anecdote, but the thing <coughs> that I always advance is the, the kind of parallel as an interview which Martin, years ago, that Martin Amos, I think, conducted with Brian De Palma, you know, the, the blood and guts American cineast, and, and, a and Amos produced this elaborate kind of question. Uh, so, Mr. De Palma, you know, you get your ideas, and you, you all the time De Palma kind of sat there like that. He says, Matt is a, Matt is a coot, you know. At one point in the interview, Amos goes, this is going great, he really is bananas. And so, so Amos produces this elaborate question about, well, it's a new story, what do you have? Yeah, you, you kind of see it in your mind, you can sit back there and all on and Tell me, Mr. De Palma, how does it shape up? And De Palma just kind of looked at me and went, it shapes up. <laughs> in other words, I'm afraid that's all really I can say. I get the idea and it just, it happens. But Helen might be completely different in this regard. Yeah, I, I heard somewhere that you're, ne you're not supposed to start with a big idea. And I, just, I think that that's why you should never do creative writing class. I think that everyone's got, always got a reason for you to, to go home and feel bad about yourself. So the first book I ever uh, wrote um, was uh, started with the question of, can two people of the same gender who bring up a baby uh, make that work? Or will one person fall inevitably into the role of the carer? And the, but I, I, you would never find that from reading that. It's, it, it's, it's about two women who, you know, it's, this is my private detective called Alison, it's called Alison Wonderland uh, from Brixton, and uh, about two women who go on a road trip. Um, so, and, and it's comedy. And with this, um, it started. It started with a, with a big idea that's still in there. So I had been volunteering as um, a mentor, working with exiled writers who'd been tortured in London, helping them to tell their stories. And um, we, um, I, I inevitably um, went home and would think, well, what, imagine if that happened to me. Um, one of the writers I worked with um, was old, well, a woman older than me from Iran and she had, she had um, been part of the, the revolution that had deposed the Shah, um, thinking that they were going to end up with something better and they ended up with something much worse. Um, 
I mean, you can argue about all of it, but anyway, she, you know, she, so she, um, she had come over here um, and um, was, you know, when well, you could, imagine how life was awful so it's a, but instead of um, trying to do if, I don't know if you've read uh, Dave Eggers uh, what is the what where he it, I think it's Valentine Valentine Ashat Deng if I'm saying his name right um, so he he collaborated with um, a, a former child soldier to tell his story so it's all written by Dave Eggers but it's this other man's story and they share the royalties but rather than trying to do that which I don't think I would be any good at because I like making things up. I I came up with um, I set my story in London, which I know, uh, with two with this young couple who had to um, who had to escape. And so it's just it, it, it's what ifs. It's uh, um, I was um, I was set it as a black comedy and it has got some funny lines in it. But um, there are people who read it and say you know I didn't laugh once. It's still quite bleak. Um, but but yes, definitely I I started off with. Uh, with the idea, with an idea, with a what if, with wanting to say, some, you know, having some grand idea about what I wanted to say, but saying it in my own style, which which is comedy or comic tone. Does anyone want to ask a final question? Yeah, I've got time for one more. I have a question about the international when you're writing, how about you? I've got uh, three children I'm trying to feed, clothe, and educate at the moment. So yeah, the commercial side of it, and one of the reasons, I'll be perfectly honest, one of the reasons I write historical novels because people seem to like them a lot more than novels set in the here and now. And uh, it's rather remarkable actually how much more people seem to like historical fiction than contemporary stuff. But um, I would also have to, you know, hold up a big placard marked "Art Suffering for and say that I do try to write stuff that. I really want to write, and the commercial considerations come secondary. Otherwise, I think you're not really being true to yourself. I think, which may sound incredibly kind of pretentious and sort of lofty, but you know, you, you have an idea. You have a you, you have an idea. If, if you're allowed to have an idea, you know, you have an idea, and you want to kind of propagate it, and then you think, well, this might actually work commercially as well. At least I like to think that, that that's the chicken that precedes the egg. Yeah, so um, I, I think it's I, I think that we, we'd all agree that you, that um, you'll really lose your way if you just try and write something to a formula that you believe uh, people are going to buy. Particularly because by the time that you know that it's successful, by the time you think Fifty Shades of Grey, uh, everyone's moved on because everyone's sick of Fifty Shades of Grey and, and, and all the imitators um, and the, or Twilight or you know whatever. There's al there's always something that that's, that that that. Um, the reason it's so successful is because somebody hadn't thought of doing it quite like that, regardless of the, you know, the, the literary value or something like that. But I think that um, that if you're um, making a living as a writer, obviously what you need to think about is whether or not you can sell the book, because otherwise you could just write it and put it in your drawer, and that's a legitimate pastime too. So. Um, Rather than trying to write something that other people write that's that's very commercial, I think you look at yourself and you think of of the things that I would like to write, what might sell best. Um, and so, particularly with these um, mysteries that I'm writing, um, a, a book of mine did really well in America a couple of years ago, and um, it wasn't a mystery. And everyone was saying, "Oh, well, I'm not, I like the writing, but I, you know, I thought it was going to be a mystery." And I thought, "Why well, can't write mysteries?" I used to love reading mysteries when I was younger. Um, I, I would enjoy doing that. My next book that I was going to write, that I still might write, um, was going to be about a woman who was um, saved from suicide by a man who may or may not be an angel at Beachy Head. I would all plot it out and I still might write it, but I thought, well, instead of writing that one, where people are like, I'll write your suicide book, okay, yeah, um, let, you know, let, us, let us have a look at it when you're finished. Um, I thought, well, why don't I write a, a mystery and why don't I write the next one? And I mean, you need to stop doing it if you, 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 know, you need to enjoy it and you need to think it's good and you need to think it reflects well on you in case you, you're run over by a bus. But you also, um, 
you also do want to make a living. So yes, it's that. It's that. It, it's finding a balance that you yourself feel comfortable with. And obviously, some feel some people feel comfortable with um, actually sort of farming it out to other people and to plus putting their name on it. Um, for example, James Patterson does that, um, and that's fine. That that sits well with him. And then other people um, want. You know, could only be obscure, and the thought that people might like it is, is almost an insult. And um, I'm somewhere between the two. Uh, thank you very much. I think we should probably end there. Um, I, I suspect there are copies of books uh, outside, um, so you feel free to, uh, to go and look. Uh, but thank you for coming, and thank you very much to David and Helen. Indeed. Thank you. Thanks.